from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Uh, and really is an honor to talk to you. It's a wonderful novel. Thank I'm you. glad we could do this. And let me try and set this story uh, a little bit. Javier Malorino, yes. your protagonist, is the best known political cartoonist in a political environment that can be lethal. Yes. I think it's fair to say. Uh, Colombia of a generation ago. Describe that territory to us, if you could. Well, well first of all, I'd like to thank you and to thank you all for coming to thank uh, Mr. Ambassador for his words. I always have the impression that uh, ambassadors are always trying to redress what we novelists mess up. <laughs> so, so thank you very much. Um, so uh, yeah, this, was, this novel was written in 2012, 2013, um, at a point in which I had to explain to uh, readers outside of my country um, the fact that uh, the story the novel tells is actually plausible in my country. It is the story of a cartoonist who is so powerful that he is threatened, um, he, uh, he is feared, mm -hmm. um, he is very well respected, he is able to change the um, the, the climate of political opinion in very direct ways. In 2013, this was not easily understandable in uh, countries other than mine. We have a strong tradition of cartoonists who are actually this, are very powerful people whose opinions are respected. Um, coming from the 19th century, uh, and in particular, uh, uh, a, a cartoonist who worked in the 20s, who was um, a huge symbol of, a tremendous symbol of um, what uh, the relationship between uh, political opinion and the political world was in my country. His name was Ricardo Rendon. So um, this, is, this is the character the novel tries to, to put in place. Uh, this person who, uh, through drawing politicians in a national newspaper is able to achieve real political influence and to, and to um, model the mm -hmm. political discussion in my country. Um, well, and, and even the, politici the politicians whom he savages yes. uh, are kind of flattered by it because it means they count. Well, they exist, yes. Yeah. Um, they have figured out that being destroyed by Javier Mayarino is, is uh, effectively uh, to exist in the political world in Colombia. Um, but the thing is, that kind of power in the hands of a political cartoonist was not something my readers in translation were used to mm -hmm. five years ago. And this has been a a very interesting, a very dramatic thing for me to witness, how in, in within uh, four years, really, since the novel was, was published in 2013 in Spanish, the world has changed so much that actually it is now more understandable that uh, political cartoonists are, um, are influential because they have been threatened publicly, um, in t uh, I mean, in terms of, of, of um, uh, international news, yeah. everybody knows what has happened with political cartoonists such as those uh, in, uh, in Charlie Hebdo uh, magazine in France. Um, and then, and you, 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 I know you spent some years living in Paris, yeah. but you wrote this novel before Charlie, Charlie Hebdo. Yes, yeah. yes. Um, or before the, the terrible Before the massacre, killed, before, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah, before that horrible thing. Um, yeah. It, that happened, I think, a little bit, maybe a year, a couple of years after my novel was published. Yeah. Uh, and um, no, it was a couple of years later because the French translation had already appeared. So yeah, it, it, it had this, this, this weird coincidence in time for me, uh, the fact that the novel was becoming reality in so many countries yeah. in the world. He's, uh, as the story opens, uh, the cartoonist is about to be given the honor of, uh, of having his self-portrait, self-caricature put on a national postage stamp. Yes, poor guy. Um, and um, 
he comes in contact with a young woman whom he doesn't remember. She's, yes. she's posing as a reporter, which, by the way, is astonishingly easy. Um, <laughs> takes no knowledge whatsoever. I'm in some position to tell you. And um, he, let me put it this way, he comes to terms with the fact that what he does does not always have positive consequences. That's the moral situation explored in the novel, yes. Yeah. This, this young lady, we're not going to reveal too much of the plot, don't worry. Um, but uh, this young lady uh, comes to him to ask him to remember, to remember the past, to remember a night that happened 28 years before in which something may or may not have happened um, at Mallarino's house. Um, that event uh, of that night um, caused Mayarino to draw one of his most um, famous cartoons. Um, and uh, this girl is, is 28 years later. She's asking him to remember what he saw during that night. And he realizes that he may not have seen what he thinks he saw that his cartoon, after all, may be groundless. Um, and that's, this is the, the, the situation explored in the novel. It was very strange for me to begin a novel in which my main subject, my main idea, was the discussion of the vulnerability of our public image, our image in the hands of people who have an influence on public opinion, um, but as the novel progressed, I, I realized I was writing about something else also. I was writing about the vulnerability of our private memories, the fact that we are never sure of what we remember. This, this difficult relationship we have with memory yeah. became um, one of the main themes in the novel. Um, there's lots I could read from. It's, it's um, beautifully written and beautifully translated. Beautifully translated by Anne McLean, yes. Um, I have to ask, why didn't you do the translation? Ah, uh, because Anne McLean would be out of a job. <laughs> so uh, uh, she's a friend of mine. I don't want to do that. Right. No, but, she's but, but you, you have done some translation. You, you've, you've also been I've done some. No, the, the, real, uh, the real reason is that uh, literature is too difficult uh, to, um, let's, let's put it this way, you should always, I've done some translation, I've earned a living as a translator, um, but you translate towards your own language because this is the language in which you are mm -hmm. close to 100%. Yeah. Um, I'm not close to 100% in English and that's, that's, uh, that's something I, prefer to leave in the hands of somebody who is. Um, and I have the, 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 this great luck of, of having one of the best translators of um, Spanish language literature in the world. Yeah. Um, that doesn't mean I, I don't dig in uh, as soon as I can. I, I, we work closely together. Um, I try to bother her as much as I can. Um, but I never lose sight of the fact that, uh, for me as a translator, one of the worst things in the world was a writer who thought they knew my language. So I try never to be that writer to Anne McLean. Uh, I, I want to read a section yeah. uh, and ask you, I, I, I love this section. Um, life is the best caricaturist. Life turns us into caricatures of ourselves. You have, we all have the obligation to make the best caricature possible, to camouflage what we don't like and exult what we like best. You'll understand, says the cartoonist, I'm not just talking about physical attributes, but of the mysterious life traces life leaves on our features. The moral landscape, if you will, that moral landscape that gets drawn onto our face as life goes by, as we go along making mistakes or getting things right. Um, it reminded me, there's a story of the, the Abraham Lincoln, um, who 
used to be a model for presidential disposition, but of course has recently <laughs> been replaced. But um, I'm sorry, I just have to avoid these cheap jokes. But um, Lincoln notably was resisting the urging of some of his aides to appoint someone as a local postmaster somewhere. And they said, why? And he said, well, because I don't like his face. And they said, Mr. President, you can't refuse to appoint a man because you don't like his face. And he said, nonsense. After the age of 40, every man is responsible for his own face. Very good. Very good. Yeah. I wish you'd told me that before. Well, I mean, it's, <laughs> we'll work on it the next one. Yeah, that was yeah. It. Um, but help us understand if, uh, caricature and how the, the cartoonist sees his, his art, because that, that has something to do with literature, too, doesn't it? Well, um, yes, in a way. For me, it had something to do with, um, with journalism in, in, in in the terms that I understood uh, journalism at the time when I was writing uh, the book. I used to be a political columnist, a weekly political columnist in my country. Um, I did that for seven years. I wrote political columns weekly for seven years. Um, then I stopped because I was writing a very long, very difficult novel um, that I will inflict on you all next year. Um, and and uh, to, to have the, both things at the same time became too difficult. So I quit political uh, commentary for a while. I still do it once in a while, every time something pops up that makes me uh, angry or indignant, which is most of the time. <laughs> um, uh, but this, this idea of this, this particular relationship we have um, as uh, columnists with readers, um, these, these, uh, these distortions of relationships that I began witnessing, the way it's very easy to, to create tensions in a room just, just by walking in, the way I lost friends, the way I had fights with family, um, uh, all that, all, all my neurosis went into the character of Javier Mayarino. So, um, discussing uh, uh, Colombian political reality uh, in print was what led directly to, to, uh, to the character and the way and the position he has, um, or rather the relationship he has with his readers in, mm -hmm. yeah, uh, in Colombia. Well, is that, is that what we do with our memories? Do we caricature our life experience? That's, I think we streamline them, yes. Yeah, um, I mean, nobody knows really how memory works, and this is one of the uh, one of the ideas at the center of the book. Yeah. Um, this this immense talent memory has to manipulate us. Um, the way uh, our memories are obviously the only window we have into our past experience. There's nothing else there. Um, well. Obviously, there are uh, other people's memories, and this is why we read books. Um, but this window is so fragile, it's so, so easily distorted, so tainted by uh, subjectivity, by, by prejudice, by uh, whatever we would have liked to happen. This is more or less what we remember. Or rather, we're very, very, very good at, at suppressing, obviously, this is, this is commonplace, uh, we're very good at suppressing what we don't like. Um, so this, this relationship with memory be uh, it, it was, became very interesting for me, how it manipulates us, how we're never sure really that we experienced or witnessed what we think we witnessed or experienced. And this is what happens to the character who um, thinks he sees something, then uh, draws a very controversial cartoon um, which has a strong impact on somebody else's life. And then 20 years later, he doesn't really know yeah. what was there. Now, I, I think a lot of Americans, too, have um, read about the life of Richard Nixon, might be reminded. And it, it, it's sometimes hard to enlist a, a sympathetic memory for Richard Nixon. Yeah. Uh, for many Americans, but there was a, a, perhaps the great political cartoonist of his time, Herb Locke, of the Washington Post, did um, a very noteworthy caricature 
day after day, obviously, in the news of this very swarthy, bearded, yeah. um, uh, sort of kind of five o'clock shadow Nixon. And yes. um, he told an interviewer uh, a number of years ago that he, he would bring the post in when it was delivered in the morning so his daughters wouldn't see it. Yeah, because yeah. Because he didn't want his daughters yes. to see it. Yes, yeah. That, uh, I got the story or, or variations of that story and quite often while I was researching for the novel. Um, there's a, perhaps the greatest uh, cartoonist of his generation um, uh, is in Colombia is called Vlado. Uh, he, his, his pen name is Vlado. Uh, he has become a friend of mine since uh, the writing of the novel because he was a source of information for me, um, invaluable source of information. And one of the stories he told me was that uh, once he had started drawing this, this, making cartoons of this very powerful military man um, in Colombia, uh, who at the time used these dark glasses, sort of Pinochet style. Um, and he had very crooked teeth, extremely uh, crooked smile. Mm -hmm. um, and this is the way he was drawn. So one day, my friend, the cartoonist, gets this, um, this message from the, I think he was a general, uh, uh, asking him for a, uh, a meeting. Mm. So when the general asks the cartoonist for a meeting, <laughs> you understand uh, Did how Did he drive a work. tank up to his office? I think there was nowhere to park. Gotcha. But, uh, yeah, um, and so in the meeting, he said, look, I have changed my glasses. <laughs> I have gone ah. to the dentist. <laughs> and you still draw me as I was before. Please don't do that. My children hate uh -huh. the, the drawings. They make fun of me. My wife is sad, etc., etc. My friend said, General, that money is down the drain yeah. because I will draw you as I wish. This is your uh, cartoon persona, and this is what you will be in the eyes of, of, of the Colombian public. So this is the power they have, which is sometimes unfair, but you know, yeah. who cares? Uh, <laughs> your work has been described as a reaction to magical realism, uh, of which we've read so much coming from, from great Latin American authors. Yeah. How do you feel about that? It's, um, I think that, that has always, even with the best of intentions, have always been oversimplified. Uh, I have, um, what I have is, what I feel is gratitude towards Garcia Marquez. One, one of the great advantages, Garcia Marquez doesn't need any kind of presentation, but he's, all, he's of course credited with having in a way um, invented this new lens, uh, it was new in the 60s, to examine Latin American reality, which is magical realism. Um, which was taken up by writers all over the world. Uh, mm -hmm. So nobody, nobody ever asks uh, Salman Rushdie or um, Mo Yan in China or uh, Ben Okri in Nigeria or Patrick Chamoiseau in, um, in the French Caribbean, how do they write under the influence of Garcia Marquez? But I get that question all the time. <laughs> so uh, I. I did you notice how artfully I actually left out yes, his name? Yes, yes, very I was, good. I was trying good. to avoid asking it for the umpteenth time. Yeah, Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> um, so the thing with this is, is that the, uh, this, this question that you have so artfully not asked <laughs> is, uh, it, it presupposes there is a sort of territorial relationship in influence, that influence is territorial. Um, so that is, 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 is justifiable, but it's almost never true in literature. Um, the fact that I'm Colombian uh, in no way means that the, the influence of the great Colombian writer immediately falls on my shoulders, like it's not influence, but influenza. I mean, like, like you're going through the streets and somebody sneezes and you get magical realism all of a sudden, you know. It's a, 
uh, uh, writers, and Garcia Marquez is the best example of this. When he started writing novels, there was no, novel, there was, there was no Colombian novelistic tradition to speak of. We had a couple of great novels, but uh, there was not a tradition as such. And so he decided his masters would be Faulkner because he wrote about a world very similar to the world of Garcia Marquez. Um, and then he got tired of Faulkner and in a way hired Hemingway. Um, come, let, uh, teach me how to write uh, short novels with spare dialogues and economic prose. And so Hemingway did the trick uh, for one book. And so <laughs> this mixture of influences, Faulkner, Hemingway, um, Kafka, a little bit of Kafka, um, uh, for, the, uh, f for his second novel, In Evil Hour, he copied Albert Camus, in a way. And that cocktail, none of these writers were Colombian, and that cocktail allowed him to discover his voice, the voice in which he wrote mm. 100 Years of Solitude. Mm. That is more or less the way it worked for me. I've always, I grew up with Garcia Marquez as a reader. I have always admired um, Garcia Marquez as a novelist. I think he's one of the two or three great stylists in the Spanish language. Um, but these images, these characters that I had in my head needed a different shape than magical realism was able to provide. And I found that um, in, um, in other Latin American writers, such as Mario Vargas Llosa or Juan Carlos Sonetti from Uruguay. Um, I found that in American writers like Philip Roth, um, in European writers, you don't want to know the list of them, um, but this is how influence in a way happens. Uh, you, you have this image in your head and you, and you choose the, the writers who have the tools you need to make that uh, become literature. Um, in my case, it wasn't Garcia Marquez. I, I, if there's one advantage I have over Garcia Marquez it is the fact that I write in a world in which Garcia Marquez already exists. He didn't. Um, he didn't write in a world in which Garcia Marquez had already written his wonderful novels. So my tradition is better for that fact. Um, and uh, and I'm, I'm luckier. So this is what happens. Yeah, yeah. We want to uh, invite your questions. There are a couple of microphones up here. Uh, we'll tell you that the, this event is being recorded for posterity. So if you're wearing a t-shirt with some kind of indiscreet <laughs> slogan, you might want to strip to your waist. Um, <laughs> Or just do it anyway, we're all friends. Um, as people advance on the mic, let me, let me uh, work in one more question. You spent years living in Europe, Paris, yes. Barcelona. Um, easier or harder to write about Colombia in Colombia than it was from Europe? Both, both. It was definitely easier uh, in the sense that um, that cliche that you need perspective to talk about your own country, that you need to get out of, of, of the woods um, in order to have a better look uh, at the whole thing. That's, that's really true. Uh, but on the other hand, I started writing novels in a world in which the internet was not as all-pervading as it is now. So uh, for my first, um, my first real novel, uh, which is called The Informers, um, I didn't have a, a strong relationship with the internet at that time. I didn't know, uh, I wrote that novel in 2002. Mm -hmm. um, so I remember perfectly having to call my father and, uh, and ask him to go to such and such corner. Tell me what you see there. Uh, are you able to see the door where uh, Gaitan, Jorge Eliezer Gaitan mm -hmm. left the building before he was murdered? Um, and so I had these informers. Uh, yeah that allowed me to write my books. Yeah, and now, of course, that's on Google Maps. Exactly. Right? That's the, um, has anyone advanced on the microphones? I don't uh, hear. Yes, by all means. Uh, you first, sir. Who got first? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I'll go first. Uh, I'm curious, uh, having seen the popular depictions of things like uh, Narcos and wh whatnot in uh, uh, popular, uh, popular culture, 
Uh, are there any that you're particularly interested in or would want to react to? Like, you know, say for instance, the, um, the pervasiveness of uh, Escobar and thoughts of uh, Colombia. Um, what are the things you mentioned earlier that provoke you to respond? Wow, uh, I don't think we have enough time to. <laughs> um, well, let's, let's, let's talk about one of those things that is in a direct relationship with uh, the other part of your question. Um, I'm, I've, I have always um, felt angry and sad and disappointed at this thing we have called the war on drugs. I think it's a huge mistake. It has been a huge mistake for 30 years. I think it, it, has, it has damaged um, and destroyed people's life, lives in a way that is not justifiable um, because drugs are essentially, this is the situation in my country and this is the situation in America too. Drugs are a twofold problem. They're a public health issue in that drug consumption is a problem and they're a, a public order issue in that the fact that they're um, uh, criminalized leads to criminality, corruption, um, enormous wealth in the wrong hands, in the hands of the mafias, of, the, uh, of criminal structures, um, and that destabilizes democracies, uh, kills people, innocent people. And I have always defended the idea that decriminalization of drugs would leave us with only one problem, the problem of how to solve the fact that people um, take drugs and that is, um, that, you know, damages their health. Uh, the enormous amount of, of money we spend on the war on drugs could be spent on prevention, treatment, education, um, et cetera. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So, so yeah, that's it. And as for Narcos, I haven't seen that show. <laughs> Thanks. Yes, sir. First of all, uh, thank you for a wonderful interview, uh, both to Mr. Vasquez and to Mr. Scott Simon. Every Saturday for me begins with Scott Simon on NPR. Well, thank so you. This has been wonderful to see. Thank you. That's very kind of you to say that. We, um, uh, well, it's a great privilege to be able to talk to so many people. Thank you. Uh, I have two questions. Uh, one is, uh, how are the libel laws in Colombia, and, and do they protect political cartoons enough? You mentioned the general and the journalist. Was there any corrective action taken against the journalist by the general? That's number one. And number two, since you mentioned that you were a political columnist, and I hope I'm getting my facts right, a year ago there was some agreement with FARC Rebels and the Betancourt release. Was Betancourt, in, yeah, so I just want your commentary on how is all that progressing because we heard there was an agreement and the agreement fell, fell apart and then something else was going on. Yeah, 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 well, uh, well, that's kind of a long answer too. Um, <laughs> one that I'm glad to give. Uh, so about the the, um, the peace process, yes, the, there was a successful peace process, the first successful peace process in the history of my country, a country that has been at, at, at war um, with itself uh, for the best part of, of, of the 20th century. According to some uh, violence, th this kind of violence uh, began in 1948. Um, the, the FARC, the Marxist guerrilla, were born in 1964. Uh, the, uh, the peace negotiations effectively ended that war, a 52-year-old war that had caused almost 7 million uh, victims, uh, counting the dead, the wounded, the displaced population. Um, and that uh, sadly was that uh, agreement sadly was defeated in a referendum which to my mind was part of the same international movement of uh, populism fueled with lies, misrepresentations and calumnies that caused Brexit and a certain president. <laughs> um, 
that was a sad day for uh, Colombians who think that uh, the peace process, the, the negotiation uh, was the way to go. Um, but after that, the, 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 the agreements were passed by Congress, through Congress. Um, so they're being implemented right now. They, I mean, uh, the, uh, the, the parties modified the agreements in, in almost every way that was asked by the opposition, um, and they're now being implemented. Um, there was a, a picture in the paper, maybe, what was it, maybe, I don't know, some months ago, six or seven months ago, in which uh, the, the biggest room in the military hospital in, in Bogota, a room that used to be filled with wounded soldiers, uh, was empty for the first time in 50 years. Mm -hmm. And that was a good moment. So, yeah, so that's, that's the situation. And your other question was? About the libel laws and... Yeah. Uh, well, no, freedom of expression is, is protected uh, in, in, in very effective ways um, in my country, uh, from what I can see, that doesn't prevent the most radical um, politicians to uh, circumvent that kind of thing and attack journalists through the social media um, using lies, using calumnies to, um, to intimidate cartoonists, political commentators, political journalists. Um, so it's it's a difficult situation i think i think social media ha has changed all this 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 relationship all these all this world um, uh, so so dramatically that we are still grasping with the consequences of that in terms of of the law we don't really know how that how that works in the new world in this brave new world um, but I, i'm afraid that's all i can say Thank you. Let me, I'm going to try and be respectful of everybody's time here. I know there's a lot to see at this wonderful event. Uh, let's get to as many questions uh, yeah, as we can, short, kind please. of make it a, okay. you know, like the, uh, what is it, we're last round of Jeopardy or something. <laughs> hey, hello. Have you ever thought about modeling any of your characters on Father Camilo Torres? I'm sorry. Have you ever thought about modeling any of your characters on Father Camilo Torres? I didn't get it. I, I'm not sure we Camilo got it. Camilo Torres Restrepo. Camilo Torres. Yes. Yes. Have I thought of making him a character in yeah. one of my books? Uh -huh. um, well, no, but that's a, an extremely good idea, I think. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Thank you very much. Do you, you, you have an agent, madam? Do you say anything about uh, Alvaro Mutis? Alvaro Mutis, what do I think about? about? Yes. Alvaro. Um, so Alvaro Mutis, um, in case uh, he's not um, familiar to you, is the other great Colombian writer in the generation of Garcia Marquez. He was Garcia Marquez's friend, um, in many ways, a kind of, uh, of accomplice, I think, <laughs> and mentor in a way. He was an extremely generous person, a wonderful writer, uh, although I prefer his poetry to his prose. Um, but I think uh, if his work is, is translated into English, um, which I'm not sure about, uh, I, I really encourage you to, to read his, his work. I share something with him, and it's a fascination uh, uh, for the work of Joseph Conrad. So this is one thing we have in common. Um, he's a great writer. Thank you for bringing that name up. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Hi. Um, so it's an honor to meet you finally. Thank you. Your book, El Ruido de las Cosas al Caer, is one of my you know, favorite books. Uh, my question for you is, what do you consider is the role of literature to heal the collective grief of Colombia? Wow. I mean, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> we should get like two hours more for this, for this conversation. Um, um, let me put it this way. This is the most succinct way I can find of, of answering this question. I think one of the, um, 
one of the things we have been able to do, uh, no, one of the things we should be able to do um, as Colombians right now with this peace process thing going on is um, find a common narrative. That is to say, these last 50 years, the 50 years, 52 years um, that the war lasted in Colombia, that created so much suffering on so many levels, so many different types of violence on so many levels, um, they are one story if told by a victim of the uh, guerrilla. There are different story if they're told by the victim of the extreme right-wing paramilitaries. There are different story if they're told by um, a, a, an inhabitant of the cities, and a different story if it's being told by a peasant. So what do we do with this? I think this is where literature can step in and try to reconcile all the different versions of our 50 years, our last 50 years, uh, or try to communicate the idea that having all these very different versions is not a handicap, it's good. Hmm. This is what democracy is about, telling different stories about the same thing and having them all be part of the Colombian story. Um, so this is, I think, what we should, we should try to do. This is the reason I write novels in a way, uh, to try to you know, uh, validate a certain version of, of, of history of our common past keeping in mind that it's different from other versions um, and that uh, that's good. So, yeah. Yes, ma'am. That sort of leads into my question. I wonder good. if you've been <laughs> introduced by the ambassador. Do you think uh, novelists are esteemed or valued differently in Colombia than they are in this country? Uh, yes. Yes, I definitely do. Um, I think for reasons that would be too long to explain and that I don't really understand completely, um, the, the, the position of a writer in the American tradition is different from the position of a writer in the Latin American tradition. Um, maybe because uh, as Latin Americans we come from the French idea of the intellectual. Uh, so novelists are expected to um, participate in the political debate, um, to participate in the social debates of their time. Um, and, and that changes the, the situation of writers. Um, I don't think a, an American novelist would be expected immediately to have all the answers ready as to the political situation of their, of their country um, at any public event. event. Um, as Latin Americans, we in a way are. And um, it's not easy. Uh, and we always have to keep in mind that, that uh, ours is the tradition also of such great writers that shaped uh, 20th century literature as Jorge Luis Borges, uh, who was not in any recognizable way a, a, a political writer. He was not a political writer in the sense that Garcia Marquez or Mario Vargas Llosa were. So we have both worlds in Latin America, but there is this expectation that, that we should fulfill, that novelists should fulfill that idea. Um, it's not always fair, uh, but I mean, uh, Garcia Marquez himself said, um, the, the, the writer's only task is to write well. Um, some days I agree with, with him, some days I don't. <laughs> but that's, I think that's the, the main difference, yes. Uh, Juan Gabriel Vasquez, um, it's been a great honor for me to be his interlocutor here. Thank you very much. Thank you very uh, much, Scott. The book we spoke about is reputations. Uh, you'll be available to sign the odd copy if yes, anyone wants. Yes, right, as many course. as you want. All right, I'd like to begin with me. Uh, I believe, as we say in the United States, you'll sign until the cows come home, right? <laughs> thank you very uh, much. Thank you very much for joining us. Yes, great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.